suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one That real good lawyer is here David Whiting, well-known Melbourne solicitor Who's got a plethora of information and advice He can share with you this morning David, hello Hello a pirate is he? Oh yes, a horror, a pirate, a pirate. Indeed, we don't do a lot of admiralty law here. Admiralty law. We don't do a lot of admiralty. Is it not law. called naval law? Is it called admiralty law? Admiralty law. Get yes. out of it. That's great. Why so, are we talking about admiralty law? Because a member of Congress uh, introduced a bill into Congress on the twenty eighth of February this year, mm-hmm. authorising the president to issue official letters of mark and reprisal commissioning private individuals to act as privateers for the purpose of seizing en- enemy vehicles. <laughs> and the enemies for this pur- purpose mm. are the Russian oligarchs who have oh. been declared as persona non grata. And so, yes. So, 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 we, we, so we, if you can find Putin's ro- yacht, sorry, if this gets passed, the, it's yes. kind of interesting. The American Constitution actually says that the president has the right to wage war and to issue... Uh, letters of mark and pr- reprisal, and they are the, you know, we we uh, yeah. we talk about the difference between privates and privateers, uh, pilots, pirates, and privateers. A privateer has a government license, uh, are directing you to go, giving you the authorization to seize a particular class of vis- vessels. Mm-hmm. Think of England and Spain two hundred years ago, uh, and now so someone has decided that. I can't see it actually getting through Parliament, through Congress, but it's interesting that someone's gone to the trouble of issuing, uh, introducing a bill for the purpose of directing that somebody go and seize some yachts. Someone go and climb aboard a super yacht and seize it like a pirate. Yes, and then you have the right to sell it and keep the money. That's the <laughs> that's the incentive that comes The individual with... um, privateer does. Yes, ah, yes, yes. The money doesn't go back to the US. What's the difference between a pirate and a privateer? A government licence. <laughs> <laughs> same actions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, same rules of engagement, same absolutely everything. Same except, Jolly Roger flag? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's my understanding that you don't get the Jolly Roger flag until you've actually succeeded. You know, oh, in a sense, that's be- like a kill, is it? Well, no, I, I would have thought that you would actually uh, lie about the flag you were flying under until such time as you'd affected the capture and yes. then you'd raise. The, it's a victory flag. It's, well, that's true. You, and you see, you'd have to um, also disguise yourself as another Russian oligarch in order to get aboard, right? Oh, yeah. You could, I'm very sure they're very carefully picking their friends at this point in yeah, time. Yeah, you wouldn't just let any old bod. But if someone came along and said, look, you know, my my um, Gucci loafers have been destroyed by the salt water. Can I, you know, borrow a pair of yours? There could then be maybe that. you can come alongside. Maybe. I was actually thinking more of Somali pirates, but yeah, I get the idea. Yep. Wow. Uh, any chance this will get through? No, not a hope. And even if, even if it does get through, I really don't see the President going and issuing these letters of mark and reprisal, which is something I had to look up this morning. I love it. Mark and reprisal. How lovely. Can David Whiting help you today? If he can, then please call 1300 222 774. Yes, Nancy in Frankston. Go ahead. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. That's all right. I'm just uh, asking about what age us senior people are allowed to drive cars. Uh, it's, you can drive them as long as you feel safe and there isn't someone who feels that you're not safe. So uh, if you're 80... I don't... Re- so it's really... I'm sorry, I I'm sorry, go on. No, it's really up to you. Your starting issue is new, you, Nancy. If you don't think you can drive safely anymore, then my expectation is you would surrender your licence. Uh, it is possible from time to time that a medical practitioner or even someone in the community might say that Nancy from Frankston is being spotted driving erratically or no longer competent to drive, at which case you will be invited to undertake a test by Vic Roads. Right? And your licence might be suspended if you don't. But there's no age limit on driver's licences. Oh, I'm very pleased to hear that because I, I live alone and uh, I'm not in a bus zone or anything like that. But I don't drink, smoke, or have no. Uh, my, my issue, or Nancy. Anything. My issue, Nancy, is your reflexes and your eyesight. They are to me the major, not your social habits, your reflexes and your eyesight. 
mate, but good luck. Well, I, I feel very comfortable because I'm able to sort of reverse my car into my driveway and things like that. And I only, oh. only go out twice a week to do my shopping. But I'm not, I was advised mm. by Vic Rose last time I renewed my licence that I wasn't to travel long distances, which I have mm. no reason to travel no. anyway. Understood. Okay. And, and, and you feel confident, Nancy, about having quick enough reflexes if the worst does happen? Oh, yes, yes, because, uh, like I said, I live in an area in which I've lived for 50 years and uh, I pick the time of day that I do drive out because I ha- used to be a crossing supervisor for 15 years and okay. I realised that you don't drive in school zone times. Okay. Yeah, no, no, definitely please stay away from those zones. Well, Nancy, good luck. It sounds like you might have it well in hand there. Peter in Blackburn South, go ahead. Good morning, Virginia and David. Go ahead. I've got a question about fencing where there is an existing fence. Uh, so this is in a rural area. Um, there's an existing four-foot fence between two properties and the neighbour wants to upgrade the fence so that their dog doesn't jump over it. And uh, I'm a researcher, so I've actually looked at the relevant acts of Parliament and I think it comes down to what is a sufficient dividing fence in terms of how you split the costs. Yes, but you're telling me it's already adequate. So the answer would well, be... Well, in, perspe- in my opinion it is, but the neighbour says it's not. So the letter of the law seems to say that they have to pay all of it, but they're asking us to pay half. Uh, when you say you're in a rural area, are you in a suburban block, you know, like a normal... House yeah, block? yeah, it's a, it's a property down at Phillip Island. It's a holiday house. So I, it's okay, so it, it's not rural; it's in a holiday area. And now, the, yep. the question is: Would you consider it to be suburbia, or would you consider it to be country? And probably Ooh, suburbia. That's a difficult one. That's well, well, now hang on. One. What I want you to do is drive around the neighbourhood when next you're there, and have a look yep. and see what the typical fences are. And that is what someone would say was a typical fence. So can I argue that, in our opinion, because the fence is not damaged, so can I mm. argue that we have, from our perspective, a sufficient dividing yes, fence can. and therefore yes, any improvements can. that they make they have to pay for? You or can certainly can argue that. The magistrate yes. will take into account what's in the suburb and make a decision then. Okay. Hope that's helpful, Peter. Thank you very much. Lee in Frankston, what's going on there? Uh, hi. Um, I've got a question about property, but it's a New South Wales situation, so it may not be the same. My daughter and her partner purchased a house in November and settlement was December, but the house was tenanted and they had to honour the contract from the previous owner and couldn't move in until the middle of April. Is that the same in Victoria? Yes. If you buy... Well, sorry. Let's... When you buy a property, you can either buy it subject to the lease or you can buy it with what's called vacant possession. Now, no, your, your daughter has bought the property subject to the lease. She steps into the view, into the role of the landlord under the lease, and that will determine her rights and obligations. Now, to complicate matters further, the house is in Lismore, <laughs> and it wasn't flooded, but her flat that she was renting was, and they've lost everything. Yes. But now the real estate con- agent contacted them yesterday and said, they don't have anywhere to go, and you can't force them out on the 11th of April. Well, I'm, I'm, that may or may not be true. Uh, it depends. There's a if in Victoria, there is a notice requirement on bringing to the end a fixed term tenancy at the end of its term, and it's either a sixty day or a ninety day contract. So, if you were re- if I owned your house, you were renting it from me, and we had a fixed term tenancy coming to the end on the eleventh of April, then I should have given you notice some time ago that I oh, don't okay. want you in the house on the 11th of April. They they need to right. get that advice about right. bringing okay. to end a fixed-term tenancy. Right. So I think what's happened is there's been a verbal agreement, but I don't know that there's been a written mm. notice. What you would normally do in those circumstances, there's generally a managing agent for the property. You would get the managing agent to get the property, to uh, right. give the appropriate notice. Great. Okay. Thanks very Thank much you. for your help today. No worries. Glad that was helpful. Uh, Matt in Patterson Lakes, how can we help? Uh, yes, good morning. I, I'm just ringing up to... Um, I purchased a property in Rye in December 2020 and I've just now had final um, confirmation from South East Water that I've been paying for a pressure sewer connection 
that the existing owners actually undertook in 2018. And I've been paying $195, you know, each quarter for that. What is a pressure um, sewer connection? So, so, so what happened, well, what's going on in the peninsula at the moment, they're removing, the, or trying to remove septic tanks. Yes. And South East Water have a new system called a pressure sewer connection. So okay. they come in and, and they they'll... Pump. Um, they pump. It's they what's pump called, it it's it's called electrical adduction. Yes. Yes. So yep. um, they undertook it, the previous owners, and sudden, somehow, according to my conveyancer, it wasn't uh, it, the information from South East Water wasn't there. So there wasn't a final deduction or it wasn't included in what, my what, Section 32. Matt, Matt, what I want you to do is look at the the rate notice that you get from South yes. East Water. Um, yes. I, got, I got caught in a transaction like this in Sorrento a couple of years ago. And yes. and the answer was it became my client's problem as the purchaser okay. to make the right. payment, and that's because uh, what the what the Water Act says is that it settlement of the matter makes the whole of the amount payable. It doesn't right. go on to say and who has to pay it. So if I bought a right. property where that was fully sewered or had this uh, deal in place, my expectation is it would be the vendor who would pay the capital cost. Yes. But the legislation just says when it's to be paid and doesn't say who has to pay it. So on my reading of the legislation, uh, I, and it comes to a conclusion I think is wrong, it's your problem, Matt. Okay. Well, okay, then. I have to leave it with yeah. you there. Sorry about that, Matt. Um, Peter in Gallenbray, is it Peter? Gallenbray. That's correct, oh. yeah. Yeah, Gallenbray. Gallenbray, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, David, Virginia. Um, over summer, we lost our little dog in bushland near Anglesey, and we were put in touch with a pet detective who was uh, based in Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, we willingly engaged, and um, part of the service offered was a thermal drone to find the dog in thick bushland. Um, we were told to pay the money for the drone operator, which was a third party. We paid that in time. Um, we then found our dog through, you know, um, various means of social media, etc. And we then no longer needed the drone operator, but the pet detective um, refuses to refund the money. We're willing and happy to pay the money for the services of the detective, but um, they refuse to, to pay us the money that was never paid to the drone operator. Do we have any um, recourse for that? Uh, it will depend really, Peter, on what your contract says. So if, okay. if you were to, let's assume I'm the pet detective and you and I reach a deal, that you will pay me for this bundle of services and we agree on a flat figure. There's no price allocated between them. But in, okay. the, if, in the other hand, if he says, and I will then engage a, uh, a drone operator at this cost, then I say that the, you only need to pay the drone operator if he pays the drone operator or if the drone yeah, operator yeah. is engaged. Yep, I understand. So um, we, I've tried several times to get an itemised account of the... the you're you're probably that, that not entitled to an itemised account. It really depends on whether he describes this as an out-of-payment expense, in which case I think you're entitled to it back, or whether it's bundled in his services, in which case you're probably not. But you need to read the contract you've got with the pet detective very carefully. OK. Thank you, David. OK. Yeah, good luck. Um, it's a tricky thing, though, if you um, got a, a drone. I don't know if you're still there, Peter. Are you still on the line? No, I think we've just lost him. Um, because a drone, a thermal imaging drone, to perhaps you know find out if that very small dog was in bushland, it would also pick up wombats, it would pick up possums, wouldn't it, and other things moving around? Uh, it would, it would. So you'd have, need to have some idea of the size of what you're looking it, for. Exactly, yeah. And it's so also, another thing that worries me about Gowan Bray is it's on the north end of the... Essendon Airport, so there'll be flight path issues. Oh, no, 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 it was done at Anglesey. The, the dog was lost at Anglesey, oh, okay. I think he said. Okay. Yeah, yep. in Bushland at Anglesey, so at the back door there, uh, uh, the back area there. Uh, Meredith in Northcote, good morning. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, uh, my next-door neighbour has demolished and is rebuilding his house, and the first thing he did was excavate a pool right next to my fence line, um, and the night before they were due to concrete that pool, um, it, it, there was heavy rain and the excavation collapsed. Uh, he then discovered that my stormwater system is discharging directly into his property. So the pipe is actually on his side of the fence 
and he says now that that is what caused the collapse of his pool excavation that I should pay six thousand dollars for that. So I'm trying to work out what my liability is when I didn't know that my stormwater system was discharging that way. I had no reason to find that out. Uh, I'm on your side, Meredith. Um, why does the stormwater discharge through his property? Were they once uh, one property? Uh, no, I think it's just really dodgy. Point. I think in this area around Northcote, there's a lot of places where the the stormwater just discharges directly, usually into people's own backyards, not connected to a pipe. But in this case, I've been here for 12 years, but it's probably been done that way for 30 or 40 years or more. Um, but the pipe is just right at the back of their property. No one would have ever known, except that he's now demolished and put a pool in the back corner of his garden. Uh, Meredith, there's the complicating factor is that in order to do the mer- to do the uh, excavation, he needed to be satisfied that your property was adequately protected. Now, yeah. had he done what the law calls protection works under the Building Act, that yeah. wall wouldn't have collapsed. Right, OK. So, 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 so that, attack is the best not. form of defence. Yeah. I think your approach has to be, tell me what protection work you did for my property. How close was he to your fence? Um, I have seen it's probably under a metre. Then he's Maybe. got an obligation, or your neighbour's got an obligation, to make sure that whatever works are being undertaken on his property don't damage yours. Sure. So I would be starting with, I'm happy to share some of the cost because you'll need to put in a new stormwater anyway, Meredith. Yeah, happy to do that. But, but sure. the issue has to be, you need to talk to his building surveyor, why was there no protection works in place yeah. for my property? Because, yeah. of course, it can rain. Now, do you think this is going to get complicated, I, I would imagine? Should Meredith engage a lawyer here? I would probably talk, I would be talking to a building inspector. There are people who do these kinds of uh, consulting. Um, I, I had one well, six months ago for a, for a pool in Malvern in exactly the same issue. And so I would be looking at a building consultant to say whether or not protection works should have been undertaken on your property. So see if you can find someone who does building inspection reports and ask them are they able to do that kind of work for you. Hope that's of use to you, Meredith, and good luck in what might end up being a very complicated part of the the neighbourhood world of dealing with neighbours. Chris in Rye, how can we help? Uh, good morning all. David and Virginia, I'll try and be succinct to give time to somebody else. Yep. Stop me at any point for questions. Uh, my mother, aged 96, died last week. She had a beautiful death in her bed, in her home, very comfortable. She was sick prior to that leading up to it and of course she like the rest of our family were fully vaccinated as a result the small percentage of my mother's family extended family and friends two percent or one percent actually two families are anti-vaxxers vehement anti-vaxxers as a result they weren't allowed to visit my mother because we wanted her life to last as long as possible yep. on the day my mother died on my day Sorry, Chris, yeah, Chris, get, get to the Chris, question. Chris, <laughs> what you're doing is you're painting the background. Yeah. Tell me what the problem is and then we'll come out from okay. that. My apologies, Seth, thank you. Uh, the, we've, we've advertised my mother's funeral and requested that only people who are fully vaccinated attend. The anti-vaxxers... Sorry, are you, going, a, are you going to a funeral sorry. home or a church? Church, church. Then you need to have a discussion with whoever is holding the celebration that you are in, that what you want to do, you want to make sure that the church recognises this this is a private function and that you have the right to exclude other people. So what you need, if it was a funeral director's, you could go, you could... Sorry. Sorry. You you need... Yes. Sorry, Chris, for interrupting you. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. I've spoken to the priest. He's fully vaccinated and he totally agrees and he just said what you said. It's a private function. We no, can end of discussion. Then you go to them and you say, without evidence, we're only allowing people into the service who've got evidence of vaccination. And so that's going, to get tu- that's going to get tough for you, Chris. What are you going to do if they are family members and you've established that rule? Uh, will you have to have people at the door? Well, this is the whole thing. We are having people the door just because these people have said it's God's house because they're religious as well as anti-vaxxers. Yep. And we have every right to come. And if you try and stop us, we'll sue you for assault. Great. Just more money for lawyers, Chris. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> uh, the the issue on. will really be, you, you just you, why don't you offer them the ability to undertake their own service mm. for your mum? 
at a different time, even at the same place. They're not going to want that, are they, no. Chris? No. They're anti-vaxxers. They want to make a point. Okay. Because okay. they're... The- they want, to, they want to come and show the rest of us who are stupid and vaccinated. Uh, Chris, my advice doesn't the issue, change. Chris. <laughs> Chris, my advice doesn't change. It's up to whoever owns the premises to determine who can and can't come in. Okay, good luck, Chris. I mean, that must be a particularly painful situation for the family. Glenys in Croydon, go ahead. Oh, hello. Yes, while I was married uh, to my um, now ex-husband, um, I I was his uh, power of attorney. Um, now, since we've been divorced, I've asked him several times to, I don't know what you call it, relinquish? <laughs> I so want it relinquished. Fire you is the answer. Pardon? You want, you want him to fire you, is that right? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Is there anything mm. I can do about yes, it? You, because it doesn't if, you have a look, not. if you have a look at the Powers of Attorney Act, you have yep. the ability to, provided your husband is competent... You have the ability to retire. Ah, oh, right? great. So he a, is competent. Good. Yep. Uh, then you have the ability to retire. If he's not competent, then you need mm. to go to VCAT to be discharged from your obligations. But right. you're fine. There is a no. form that you fill out by which right. you give up the job. And where do I get the form and how do I, do I serve it I to would, him personally? I, well, you could send it to him in the mail. I would have a look at thelawhandbook.net.au. And you will find the form there. Uh, the other place you would look is the uh, legislation website. For, sorry, have a look at the Office of the Public Advocate. They will have a form there for you to cancel your power of attorney. Okay, and we hope that's helpful. Good luck. I think we can fit in one last call. Jamie in Brunswick. Jamie, you'll be our last call. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the call. So I've, I've just set it out. I have a property that was subdivided so I had a house on the property I subdivided the back area and to rebuild another house on the new allotment yes a survey was done on the on the property which involved one the the boundary line to the neighbor yep that registration of subdivision was registered subsequently yep the house at the back was built and I'm now ready to move in However, it's a temporary fence between my place and the neighbour. The neighbour now disputes the new boundary line that the surveyors did. Jamie, because I can it, tell you that the legal line between... Because until the subdivision, the properties were in the same ownership, so the concept of adverse possession doesn't start to apply until the survey was completed and there's a change of ownership. So they are stuck with the boundary line as it appears from the survey plan prepared by the surveyor. End of discussion. My question, my, my question really is this. We've got kids and there's a temporary fence now dividing the, their house, their property and our property, but he refuses to have a fence line put up on that new boundary line and he's got all sorts of conspiratorial reasons as to then why Jamie, the Then, Jamie, you are stuck can with... I, can I, and you are stuck can with I the process as the fence? No. Well, no. You, you can and you can't. As a matter of practice, you can. As a matter of law, if you put up the fence today, you're bre- without a court order or your neighbour's agreement, you are breaching a provision in the Fences Act and are liable to a fine. But if, you set the, if the fence was set back on my side of the new boundary line, say an inch, what about then? Then you need to talk to Moreland and find out whether that constitutes building work for which you need a permit under yep. the law as it applies in Moreland. Good. OK, thanks for that. Thanks, Jamie. Good. Glad to, we were of help. Nice to see you, David. We'll see you next week. Thanks. David Whiting there, Melbourne solicitor, and I'm glad we could help so many people today.